evening, everybody, and welcome all of you to this live program at All Three Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Alexander Lederman from Geneva, Switzerland. Dr. Lederman is a private person at the University of Geneva. He's a CEO of BMED and also the president of the Swiss Shoulder Society and also president for the Foundation for Research and Teaching in Orthopedics, Sports Medicine, Trauma and Imaging, the four group. He's also president of the membership committee and member of the central committee of the European Society for Surgery of the Shoulder and Elbow, and also the member of the central committee of the French Arthroscopic Society. Moreover, he's chairman of the 11th advanced course on shoulder arthroscopy and has been the president of the Congress of the European Society of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery in Geneva, and also the fourth International Congress on Adipose Stem Cell Treatment in Zurich. Dr. Lederman also serves as the editor for the Journal of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery. If you've noticed, Dr. Lederman has lectured on our channel in the past, and it has been a very wonderful lecture. So today, it's my great honor to bring back Dr. Alexander Lederman for this wonderful live program. Over to you, Dr. Lederman. Thank you so much, uh, my friend, for this very nice introduction. I would like to talk today about uh, artificial intelligence and um, ma mainly about artificial intelligence uh, and rotator cuff repair. So I don't have any conflict of interest regarding this uh, presentation. So nowadays, AI is mainly used uh, to improve accuracy in surgery. It's used with software to predict the, the shape of the glenoid, um, but this is, not abs this is not used in a, in a daily practice. We, we have some problems and the, the, the first case example will be for planning surgeries. We have some problems because most of the data are based on um, computer modeling and it's based on a few scapula, but we are all different. We all have different anatomy. And for example, this is two scapula coming from uh, people living nowadays on earth. And you can see that the difference is tremendous. Uh, the, this is a dispersion of 10,000 scapula. So you see that the dispersion is absolutely huge and it's absolutely not the same if you are on the one side or on the other side. So we try with these 10,000 scapula to, to create models and then to do regression, meaning that we calculate all the lengths of the, of the scapula. And with these 10,000 scapula, we created seven models that would represent the 10,000 scapula. So from minus three to plus, uh, two plus three. And we have consequently for each model, some lens, the measurement that uh, we can estimate and we can work precisely um, uh, in order to determine, for example, the best position of a glenosphere if you want to implant a reverse shoulder autoplasty. And then when you, you, you implant um, on these scapula prosthesis with diff, uh, different design, plus 10 of lateralization, uh, plus five of eccentricity and so on, different uh, size of the glenosphere, you will observe that depending of the range of motion that you measure, things are not really changing. For example, in abduction, you can see that depending of the design for one of these seven scapula, you can change a lot of parameters. However, things are not going to change dramatically. However, for adduction, this is absolutely the opposite. The design of the prosthesis that you will implant is crucial because if you don't have the right design for this specific anatomy, you can have um, 30 degrees of adduction or almost zero degree of adduction. So this makes a huge difference. And the problem is when you try to take into account all these factors. And at that time, you begin to understand absolutely nothing because there are too many factors. 
to take into account. And you realize then that artificial intelligence is going to be a fantastic help to determine for each patient with a specific anatomy uh, and specific expectation, what is the best design. So artificial intelligence, for example, for surgical planning is going to be in the future, the key. And as you know, the future is tomorrow. So it's mainly used today to improve accuracy in surgery, but is surgery the key for a good result? Is it because you are a good surgeon that you will have good results? And interestingly, it's not always the case. For example, we published with Philippe Collin a study in 2015 about 365 rotator cuff. And after each surgery, we, we add a smile close to the operative report. Uh, we are very happy with the surgery. The surgery was not so great. I have been disappointed by this surgery. And we compare this intraoperative feeling with the postoperative result and observe that whatever you do, even if you are very happy or unhappy, the result is absolutely not correlated to the clinical result because probably the surgery is not the key for a good result. And the key, according to me, is surgical indication. So the story began the 6th, 17th of May, 2019. Uh, I was at the chief of the Shoulder and Elbow Society in Switzerland um, in front of the Swiss Medical Board because the Swiss Medical Board tried to prove that rotator cuff repair is absolutely useful. And during this uh, interview, a, a lawyer asked me, but excuse me, sir, do, do you have finally clinical guidelines for your uh, rotator cuff repair? And I had to admit at that time that we don't have good guidelines. We, we know when, we probably know when we don't have to operate, but we don't know yet when do we have to operate. So to improve outcomes of rotator cuff repair, one solution that is regularly proposed, and it has been proposed by the Swiss Medical Board, to is to improve patient selection for surgery. And you can, for this, launch prospective comparative study. So you begin studies, and 15 years later, you will have the result. But these long-term results, even if they are needed, when they are finally obtained, um, they became obsolete because the surgical te technique has changed. Consequently, it just annihilates these kind of studies utility. What we are going to do now cannot be analyzed in 15 years because in 15 years we will do another job. So we take during clinic important decision, but actually we are bad. We have something like 20 minutes to analyze hundreds of data and we don't know how to identify at-risk patients. And interestingly, human performance in analyzing images uh, when you have a look to your MRI, for example, can be inadequate and inconsistent. And I'm just going to show you two examples. And I'm really sad because this is study that I published and study that clearly demonstrated that I'm really bad. So, for example, we published with Shin a study in arthroscopy in 2018, and we were looking at the tangent sign. And there was, an, um, uh, there was a concordance of only 0 0.78, meaning that in around 25% of the case, a uh, shorter surgeon could not determine if a muscle was above or under a line. This is absolutely dramatic. And it's exactly the same. It's even worse, actually, for fatty infiltration. The intra-observer rareability is bad, around 0, 0 0.74. Um, so this is really dramatic. So if we could have a machine, for example, that will analyze automatically this data, it will ease the burden of the orthopedic, orthopedic surgeon because this will provide obviously more precise and objective analysis. 
Another problem is that clinical decision that we take nowadays are only based on 3% of the population that participate in clinical trials. And this is wrong to say that these 3% of the population represent all the population. So, but this is what we do every day because this is the only data that we have. So when you think about what the cuff repair uh, is said to be indicated when non-operative treatment fails uh, in active patient with full thickness tears uh, without a sign of advanced tendon degeneration without uh, important fatty infiltration, not uh, grade three, grade four fatty infiltration, and without important tendon retraction in massive rotator cuff tear. So this is when we should consider uh, uh, a repair. However, there is very little uh, evidence behind this recommendation and clinical practice guidelines for diagnosis and treatment are not only rare, but they are also imprecise. So indication for surgery depend actually of a myriad of factors. It's patient related factors. So meaning the BMI, diabetes, so all the comorbidities, motivation of the, uh, of the patient and so on. It's based on pathology centered factors like the tendon retraction, the fat infiltration, uh, the quality of the tendon, quality of the bone, all these factors. And then there are also technical factors, but as I said previously, these are not maybe the keys um, of the result. And again, it's something that is really difficult to adequately analyze in clinical practice. Uh, surgeon judgment is clearly not uh, inf um, infallible. Um, we, it may lead to overtreatment, probably that we operate too much patient. And it also may prevent, if we find a way to have better indication, it may prevent some colleagues to operate every single patient that enter in their office, because from time to time, unfortunately, this is the case. So to have something that could help the... Um, um, to help the surgeon to improve outcome of rotator cuff repair, another possibility will be to preparatively isolate patient that will not truly beneficiate from a surgery. Um, in a study that I published again with Philippe Collin in 2015, we, we show that 80% of the old patients were doing everything at six months. 94% uh, at nine months, meaning that at nine months, there is still 6% of the patient that do not work. Uh, and most of, the, most of the patient has not healed their tendon. And in another study that is on the submission uh, done by the French Arthroscopic uh, Society revealed that 12% of the patient at one year after rotator cuff repair remain unhappy. So if we could find preoperatively, which will be the six to 12 percent of the patient that do not completely beneficiate of the surgery, uh, it will help us to do the right choice. And if you think about it, this is a rare, win, perfect win-win situation. Because if you do less surgeries, you will have more time for explaining for reassuring, for empathy uh, to the other patient, because empathy is something that is nowadays missing because we have too much, we need to go fast. If you can detect the patient that will be at one year unsatisfied, you will have less unhappy patient. And this is a very important concept because I remind you that you need nine very happy patients to compensate one patient that will remain unhappy and that will criticize you during the next 10 years. So unhappy patient is in your waiting room and in your city a disaster for you. So if I could have less of this unhappy patient, actually, I will have better outcomes, better problems, 
and consequently at the end probably more patient because I will have a better reputation. And then you will have happy insurances because at least at the beginning it will cost less and you will, you will, you will also have, have happy government. So this is a perfect win-win situation to know exactly if we could avoid to operate these six to 12% of the patient, you, um, you are in a win-win situation. So the goal of the, the, the study that we, we did was to develop, uh, and this is a pilot study because of course, then this is a platform technology, you can translate it for all other joints. So to develop a system to have automatically red flag depending of numerous factors. So the, the goal at the beginning was not to take 200 factors, but to have a minimal data set and consequently to have, if possible, more targeted interventions. Uh, it was also to show a significant decrease in the number of complications and surgeries and a decrease in healthcare cost over time and a significant improvement in uh, results. And finally, it was to determine efficient guidelines that are still missing today, at least for the rotator cuff. So what we did, we took uh, quite a huge database with 6,600 patients. And we wanted to have for these, uh, for this pilot study, uh, complete data. You know probably that with artificial intelligence, you, you have algorithms that allowed to compensate for missing data. But at the beginning, we wanted to have complete data. So from these 6,600 uh, 6, patients, uh, we took 920 patients that had complete a complete data set. Um, input columns were smoker, diabetic patient, classification of tear, size, retraction, and so on. And this will predict the one and two years same score, meaning the result of the, the subject, subjective result of the surgery. So we had a training subset with, um, uh, we, we took randomly 89% uh, of the overall data set and then a testing set that consisted of the remaining 11%. And from the training data, we took 20% of the training data and use it as a validation set. And this is, this is the, the result. And they are actually very interesting because after an accuracy training phase, the accuracy was around um, 80%. Then we use um, artificial intelligence and with simple model like decision tree model, the accuracy increased to 89%. And finally, with deep learning, the accuracy almost reached, reached 97%. And uh, believe me, this is something that is huge because in the medical field, if you are uh, above 90, 95%, this is already very good. So we reach 97% and we are still working on the result because they are, they are, there is definitely place for improvement. So this is something that I learned during my studies. It takes five years to learn uh, when to operate and 20 years to learn when not to. And all studies suggest that the second part of this quotation might not be relevant forever, meaning that probably that in some years, the machine will tell us when probably we should not uh, operate. Uh, the, 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 the data set was sufficient to achieve a promising model accuracy of 97%. And this is encouraging, but we need uh, more because in the uh, data set, we had interoperative um, factors and they were, there was no um, imaging factors. And we have to replace this interoperative factor by image, images uh, analysis. So consequently, it will, be, it will be only based on preoperative factors. And this is very important because um, if you, you need to console your patient preoperatively, of course. Um, 
because communicating the expected result from a proper surgical treatment, it's an important component of informed consent. And this will allow for most effective clinical decision making. So it's really crucial to have a data set that is only based on preoperative data. And for the moment, in all data set, we had intraoperative data, but we are going to compensate this intraoperative data by preoperative data coming from the um, imaging and analysis. So the goal is not, you, you, you know that the goal is not to prevent some patient to benefit uh, uh, from a surgery. So it's not misused to deny, the, but rather support treatment, acting as a safeguard and potentially preventing unnecessary and costly surgeries. So artificial intelligence has uh, the potential to analyze more efficiently and subjectively data, stratifying risk patient based on to unlock the data of a much larger proportion of the population. And it's also, it has the potential to move to the next level of evidence-based medicine called personalized patient care, meaning that we will be able for um, a very specific patient to have a prognosis. However, this kind of study has a lot of limitations that we, we have to admit. And first of all, there is a very long way to certification because in healthcare, three parameters are crucial. Interpretability, consistency, and explainability. And if you don't succeed to prove to EU or to FDA that uh, these three parameters has been taken, taken into account, uh, you won't have any certification and you won't be able to use your model. So prediction regarding interpretability and consistency, prediction itself is insufficient. The model should also provide a metric so that a clinician can determine if the model can be trusted in relation to any given patient. This is crucial. And then it has also, uh, there is a need to assess whether a model is consistent with the existing medical understanding and also if, it's, if it is interpretable. So the model has to be interpretable. You need to understand your model. And finally, for explainability, um, this is very interesting because you need to explain your model. However, you can only explain um, easy or yeah, easy algorithm like decision tree or linear regression. And then as soon as you move to deep learning like neural networks, networks the accuracy increase. And this is why we obtain 97 of results, but you lose a lot if in interpretability. So you need to choose at the beginning, probably that you have to use um, model with a low accuracy, but that you can easily interpret and then to go progressively to deep learning in order to have more accuracy. But this is not so easy. Another problem is the penetration of artificial intelligence in hospital. Uh, this is from 2018. And you see that in 2018, only 5% of the institution were using artificial intelligence. So it, it has clearly to, to increase. And you will see that if you began to use it, uh, some people we some people won't understand and will be very reluctant. And another problem is the responsibility. If the machine say if the machine provide a red flag, this patient cannot be operated. Who is responsible? Is it the surgeon? Is it the machine? This is a problem, and this has to be determined. And for the moment, uh, neither the FDA or um, nor the EU. Uh, has decided who is uh, who is relates to legal framework. We have no idea what are the rights of the patient for the moment. Nothing is determined, so everything has to be elucidated before launching such uh, such uh, software. So, in conclusion, AI will probably become become the norm, and this is coming soon. I think. Uh, 
uh, it might provide red flag and this will ease the burden on orthopedic surgeon. Um, we need to take the lead because we have the data. Otherwise, government, insurances, medical institution will do the job for us and they will impose their vision. So thank you very much for your attention. I just wanted to say that we launched yesterday a social, social network called BMedNet. Uh, and if you are a shoulder surgeon, you can go there now. You will see it's very interactive and you, can, you will be able to share cases. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Lederman. Uh, yet another cutting edge work from your side. Uh, just a few questions. Uh, for example, uh, how do you clinically apply this? I mean, it's great technology. So when a patient comes to you, you put in, I mean, the images as well as the patient data, right? You, you look at moments, reflection, abduction, et cetera. How do you do it exactly? So the goal, um, after certification, we'll have to have a database in which you will introduce uh, the clinical data. So already in my office, uh, I'm using a software called FollowWells. In, in my office, you are, when you arrive, you have to fill your name, your weight, your, uh, your so BME, uh, comorbidities, and so on and so on, the pain score, the satisfaction score, all, 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 all these factors. And then when you enter in my office, we do a clinical examination. So I add uh, some, the, some tests, I add range of motion. So the machine has all, almost everything. And then the goal is to introduce the CD of your MRI into the machine to have an automatic reading and consequently enough data to provide uh, a prognosis. And of course, if, if the machine say, the machine is not going to say, uh, you cannot operate this patient. The machine will just say, excuse me, sir, but 10 of your colleagues operate similar patient, 10 failed. Are you sure that you, you really want to operate this patient? And uh, this kind of red flag, red flag, I think are very interesting because it, from time to time, it just open your eyes. A lot of colleagues failed. Why are you going to succeed? Are you really better than the other ones? Do you think a scoring uh, at the moment, till the AI becomes a, I mean, a very popular? Do you think a very good scoring system? For example, you input the range of motion, the degree of uh, retraction, the fatty infiltration, and all that. A good scoring system can really predict a, if the outcome is going to be good or bad. Do you think that's Currently, we can do a, we can have a, we have a similar scoring system. Yes, and interestingly, we, we use a very small um, data set, and already with a small data set, we had uh, an unbelievable accuracy. So, of course, the more data we will add, the more it's it's going to be accurate. And um, I'm I'm quite confident in the future. The only way is the only thing is to collect this data and you know the, this is a burden this is a burden for my secretaries this is a burden for the patient so can can, can we do it for every single patient this is another question thank you dr lederman one last question before you wind up uh, see we have mentioned a lot of factors that affect the outcome of a rotator cuff repair right do you think abnormal light profile if a i high think that do you think an abnormal lipid profile, cholesterol, total cholesterol, yeah. LDL, affects the long-term outcome? Because I happened to read a recent paper in the Arthroscopic Journal, which says that the outcomes are not good if your total cholesterol or a lipid profile is not good. Yeah, this is probably the drama of my life because... Everything that I love, meaning sport, tobacco, alcohol, good food, lipids, are really bad for the cuff. Yes, this is a drama. I agree. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Lederman. I think that's all the questions that we have. And we really look forward for, I mean, uh, the next part, which you'll be coming with artificial intelligence, when you start applying AI into your clinical practice. Thank you very Thank much you. for joining in. Thank you very much. Sir. I wish you a very nice day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.